Welcome to another episode of Hometown History. I'm Jamie. I'm Dami. And this is little baby Otto. He is two and a half months old. Hopefully he'll be able to hang out for us for most of the episode. But <laughs> I hope so. There's one thing I learned about being a mom. You can't make plans. You just have to be flexible. He also had four ounces right before this. So little dude will get sick. Uh, so I'm sorry if you can't handle that. I'll try to try to shield it, you know. All right. So tonight's episode is called... Signs of the Times, learning York County history through markers. This is episode 3.3. Yeah, and so our agenda, we have six items on the list. The Automobile Age, the Keystone Marker Program, Signs Lost to Time, the Lincoln Highway, the Haines Shoe House, and Ghost Signs. And then as a special bonus, number seven is Protest Signs. Yeah, a little extra there for you guys. We're hoping that at the end of today's presentation that you have these four takeaways. First is that these signs and markers are efficient ways to catch a glimpse of our region's history. They establish York County and the region in the larger American story. They're versatile, meaning they translate well online for students and researchers. And my personal favorite, they force us to slow down to like stop and read something. Right. Kind of like stopping and smelling the flowers. A little bit about me. My name is Jamie Norpel. I have a website that I co-run with Jim McClure called Witnessing York, where a lot of our videos are housed. I have a local history blog called Wondering in York County, and I got my PhD from Penn State Harrisburg in American Studies. Yep, and I'm Domina Schmiller, and I'm a Civil War reenactor in my spare time with the 87th PA. And during the day, I am a Third Circuit Court of Appeals librarian in Harrisburg, and I run Preserving the History of Newburytown when I'm not doing Hometown History with Jamie. Which has more members than it does residents in Newburytown. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so getting into tonight, let's transition into the 1900s. Yeah, so you're talking about taking things slow, so... We went from horse-drawn carriages to the automobile age. So roadways crossing York County were dusty and muddy, and that's because of all the horses in the wagon. So here's two pictures of our family members. That's your great-grandma, mm -hmm, right? Yeah. And then this is my great-grandpa in Newberrytown and Red Lion. And that shows you what it was like before automobiles became popular. And some of the roads that they went over were actually planked with wood. So you can imagine how uncomfortable and bumpy that was, just trying to get across the county through mud and sticks and I really can't though no like, like I, I, <laughs> we're spoiled I, yeah. I like Otto falls asleep in the car now but he wouldn't have fallen asleep on that ride no definitely not <laughs> <laughs> so then Henry Ford ended up democratizing the production of cars into an affordable commodity and the average York County now had access to a different form of transportation which was much more comfortable and more fun if you ask me yeah absolutely and I, I mean I appreciate my vehicles <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, York County is actually known for creating a famous car if you know what that car is put it down below your timestamp's got to beat where we are right now 305 and it is the Pullman here's what it looks like there on the far left so the Pullman motor car they created approximately 12 to 20 thousand of these were manufactured right here in York and at its peak the Pullman factory employed 900 workers Wow, pretty good they could from start to finish create this automobile in just 36 days over on the right there, that is a picture of the first Pullman six-wheeler. It was created in 1903. Uh, anything but a smooth ride. <laughs> <laughs> right. You'd think that more, more wheels would make it easier, but uh, they, they did not. It was very, very bumpy for these guys. So... Uh, the all of these cars uh, made this like public outcry that we want nicer, smoother roads. The planks aren't working anymore. The dirt isn't working anymore. And so the public outcry was so loud that in 1903, the Commonwealth created the Pennsylvania Department of Highways. Right. So across the nation, there was this movement. It was the Good Roads Movement. So that was from the late 1800s into the early 1900s. And this was the progressive era. And it was a community-based effort to reform society, helping others by improving their lives. So the the Good Roads Movement linked rural communities to the city, so you had better access to schools, libraries, helping others by um, going to the market, getting food, and the Pennsylvania Department of Highways was one of the earliest of such departments of any state in the nation, and its markers were literally signs of Pennsylvania pride. So mm -hmm. we were finally ahead of the curve for once. Yeah, a picture of the very first sign uh, in Pennsylvania right here. Right. So it makes us think about what these signs symbolized for mm -hmm. Pennsylvania. Uh, York was coming into this new age. The automobile changed the face of America and the right. world. Um, and at this 
point in American history, your county is cutting edge. We manufacture <laughs> these cars at the turn of the century. Um, and so it made us think about York County and how modern are we? Like right. in World War II, we created the York plan. Um, and so today, comment below, do you think York is modern? Do you think we're behind the time, stuck in the mud? Right. Combination of both? I feel like we ebb and flow. Sometimes we get it right, sometimes we're a little behind, but yeah. I feel like we get there in the end. Yeah, yeah. good. Yay, go York County Pride. I'm trying, I'm I know, trying. I like where we're from. <laughs> but yeah, please comment. We want you to interact with us since we're not in person today, we're just on Facebook Live. But we're going to transition to the Keystone Marker Program. So why are we called the Keystone State? So there's another trivia question for you. So that actually comes from architecture. Uh, it references the wedge-shaped stone that holds archways in place. And geographically, we're the central to holding together the northeast and the southeast, connecting the two sides of the early nation, the north and the south. And the Keystone is now a symbol of many Pennsylvania entities. So you can see there, I mean, it's a super versatile uh, logo that's used throughout the state. And businesses even use it, too. Too. like the keystone like that's kind mm -hmm. of a, tr a trademark of our area we kind of just ran with the keystone <laughs> yeah <laughs> which i mean why not it yeah. works and york county has many towns and names that range from a for airville to z for uh what did he say Zion. zion's view uh, <laughs> <laughs> jamie didn't think anything ended with a z yeah. but uh she has here that it ends with y, y for york haven which Plus is where very we live. close to where we are but if you have any other towns that end in z let us know jim caught us and said zion's Zion, view yeah. but that honestly wasn't um, at the top of my head when we were thinking about this. And many of the towns and boroughs were once marked with cast iron name signs, and they were painted with the Pennsylvania official colors, which were blue and gold. So I don't know how many people actually know that PA had official colors. So I think that's pretty cool. And there's an example along the Susquehanna, which we're going to show you. And there are elongated horizontal keystone shapes for the Keystone State. And at least two were put up, one on each end of town along the major state road. Here is another example of York Canoe Salem, named for the settlers from York County, but then also Salem founded the whole way back in the 1800s. So if you notice, um, there are many mounted on this like decorative fluted cast iron posts that are also painted blue. Mm -hmm. Many of these signs, if they're rammed, they had this hinge down at the bottom that allowed it. So if a car were to hit it, it could flex over. Um, Jim McClure tells us that this is more of a modern development. Right. Um, just in the past few years, historically, if people hit the sign, it just disappeared. And these signs are made of cast iron, which explains re relatively fragile, maybe right. not for your cookware, but for signs to Yeah, uphold. if you run your cookware over with a car. <laughs> it's not going to last. Um, so today we don't really have a lot of them. Right. Um, they also showed us more than just town names. These signs had things like speed limits, um, no parking signs, locations such as historical sites, mountains, and rivers. I've got a few examples here that we wanted to show you, such as this one, showing you warning, change in direction. Same with this one, danger, there is a sharp curve. And my personal favorite... <clears throat> School zone. Why are you laughing, Tommy? <laughs> it's a terrible picture. It's posed. It's posed. Don't be alarmed. It's a fake photo, but it was meant to show you that school zones are dangerous. Uh, slow down because of kids. Uh, and like this car potentially just hit that kid, which I mean, at the time had to have been driving away at 20 miles per hour. I mean, you could, you could catch it really. As everyone just stands and stares. Yeah. <laughs> So some of the markers even show the name of the manufacturer in small letters on the back side. And Carlisle, Foundry of Carlisle, Pennsylvania, you can see that stamped in the back. And unlike modern town name signs, which only give the name, these cast iron marker markers also have the name and a number at the top. Can you guess what the number on the York Haven sign means? Do, do, do. <laughs> it means Lewis Ferry is nine miles away. So it showed you the distance to the next town. And there's also a little bit of information about the source of the name and the year that the town was founded. Wording has to be direct and concise because it's a small sign. You can't really get that yeah. much in there. That tons of space. Right. And they can actually be used for backdrops for <clears throat> some really nice pictures. Yeah. Here's one for a Dallas town named after the vice president, George M. Dallas. And then this one, just in your neck of the woods. Yeah, uh, Luke from the Goldsboro Historical Association posted that for us. So Just a couple days ago. So thank you for everyone who's tuning online who are sh is sharing content. We are trying to create these videos to enhance the love of our area and our place and history. So thank you for interacting. You taught us something new. And I was really impressed with the Goldsboro Historical Association's website. Their mm -hmm. articles are very well written. So thank you for all the work that you do for local history.
Now we're going to play a quick game. Uh, another nice. local historian named Stephen Smith, a friend of ours, he saw an article in a Pennsylvania magazine about the Keystone Markers, and it included a contest to see if you can guess what the signs were. What he did was he removed the name of the town and just put the context. So here's the first one. It's close to your cave There's your hint. Two miles. Right. And it was named for Climber Shelley, an early merchant. I think it's Cly. Good job, Dami. <laughs> Almost like I had the answers ahead of time. <laughs> All right, next one. Let's see if you guys get this one. Moving down to the southern part of York County, named for the pure air in the neighborhood from the 1800s. You say air. Airville. <laughs> Yes. And last one, uh, close to York, named for the fine view of the surrounding country. Oh, that has to be East Prospect. Yes. <laughs> you know, that this one could have been a lot of different places. It could have. I, mean, I guess if you're really good at knowing what is exactly 11 miles, miles away. From yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are many times where we just drive around in the rolling valleys that are right. like York. You know, I just, I just, I think this area is really, really beautiful. It's better than Lancaster. Unfortunately, though, not all of the signs are accurate, which <laughs> we're going to learn about in a second. So June, uh, June Burke Lloyd found an issue with the Keystone marker in Red Lion, and it had the founding date wrong. So the sign reads 1736, even though Red Lion was founded in 1880 from parts of York Township and Windsor Township. York County was actually a part of Lancaster County until 1749, and most of York County Township's roots go back to Helm Township, which was laid out in 1739. But that was while it was still part of Lancaster County. And the treaty between the Native Americans and the Penn proprietors that officially allowed the sediment on the west side of the Susquehanna occurred in 1736. Mm -hmm. So lots of dates. So yeah. I can understand why they probably got it wrong. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, you have to go back and you have to check these things, especially if you're going to put it in cast iron and mount it in town. Yeah, so. you, you kind of got to get it right, right, for sure. I always cringe when I write articles that just happened to me last past week. I spelled someone's name wrong. Oh. And Jim luckily caught it. He's great at that. But it's like, as a historian, we've got to get quotes right and dates right and names right and and those of us who aren't as detail oriented it's one of my things I'm working on <laughs> it's good to have an editor <laughs> like the outer space oh, just like oh, no. I promise he's comfortable he's <laughs> he's just chilling it's just the cheeks I know I can't believe he was two months premature he's I know like, he's a chunker he's, now guys it's amazing you know, he's filling out well so just like Red Lion there was this issue there was a town called Mount Wolf that's close to where we are that actually had their sign that was wrong Wrong. It said that it was named after Pennsylvania's seventh governor named George Wolf. And while it was named after a guy named George Wolf, it had nothing to do with our governor who was in office from 1829 to 1835. So they ended up taking the sign down. They said it doesn't uh, historically accurate. So we're not just going to have it. Poor George Wolf. Yeah. For a while, he had a sign named after him. <laughs> so that's not the first, though, Keystone markers that are lost to time. Right, so we love the uniform designs of these markers, and they make them easily to find, but that's only if they still exist. So tens of thousands were installed between the 1920s and the 1940s, but today there's probably only about 600 total. Tens of thousands. Yes, to 600. Yeah, yeah it's a lot. Sad. It's kind of sad. It's a lot. Yeah. So these priceless artifacts are state pride in local history, and they've fallen into decay. Mm -hmm. So why did that happen? So they're made of cast iron, which we've talked about before, and that means they're pretty brittle, and that means that weather, time, automobiles mm -hmm. have caused them to either be destroyed or taken down. And then the development and road expansion also led to dismantlement. And they replaced them with simple aluminum markers. And they only really note the, the name, name of, of the, the town. town now. Yeah, they don't have the whole spiel like the, the Keystone markers yeah, do. Yeah, another name. Yep. Also, years of neglect uh, means that it really takes local interest and in action for us to get these markers put back in place. We're fortunate in our communities to retain even just one of these. So, right. for example, Philadelphia, which is Pennsylvania's largest city with 1.6 million people, they once displayed markers, I mean, dozens of them, because right. if you think of all the intersections that would have cut through Philadelphia, they have one. One. Mm. Pennsylvania's second largest city, which is uh, Pittsburgh, they have zero, not a single one stands. And then closer to us, Harrisburg, we're told through the Keystone Marker Trust that there's only one that remains there. It's upsetting Otto. <laughs> it's really sad. <laughs> Auto. So it's really up to individuals and organizations, local governments, for them to get involved or they disappear. Right. Or you have to have a busy body like me in your yeah. town. 
<laughs> so PennDOT legally owns the Keystone markers, and it's a low priority to them, which I understand. They have a lot going oh, on. on yeah. So they encourage locals to adopt their markers by locating them, documenting them, and repairing them. So that's where I come into play. And I uh, contacted the Newbury Township supervisors, and I asked if we still had our signs. I knew that we should have two of them, but I wasn't sure if they still existed. Mm -hmm. And we found them in a storage closet, and they've been working with me. I picture you with, like, a flashlight. Like, <laughs> in the dark. Uh, it was a maintenance man with a flashlight. Um, but yeah, and they photographed them and we sent them to the Keystone Marker Trust to prove that they existed. And then we contacted PennDOT and we're following the PennDOT rules. You have to have the right um, pole that they're attached to. Wow. It has to be a specific paint color. Hmm. Um, yeah, so you have to get them up to spec and you have to be in agreement with PennDOT before the they can go up and they have to be in the exact right spot because, you know, if it says nine miles from yeah, Lewisbury, it's got to be nine miles, be nine miles yeah. from Lewisbury. Mm -hmm. So you're probably wondering, well, like, why is a Keystone sign important to me? <laughs> um, it's ultimately a way for us to honor the Quakers that first settled our town and they founded our town in our area. And my goal has always been to foster pride in our town. And I believe that it's another way to teach future generations about our history. So if you're interested in rehabbing any signs, Go look for them in your town, adopt one, contact the Keystone Marker Trust, contact your township or your borough, contact PennDOT, make sure everything's up to snuff, and they'll work with you. Um, it will cost money, um, but you can probably raise that together between the township and, township you know, like local fundraising. But yeah, I think it's a worthwhile endeavor. Got me when you were 10 years old and your mom's here so I can ask her. <laughs> At 10 years old, would you think that you would know so much about the Keystone Marker program and the specs? No, not at 10. <laughs> no, I was watching This Old House and I was obsessed with Norm Abrams <laughs> at 10. Oh, so I was a nerd back then, just a different type. <laughs> My mom um, can account for that. <laughs> These keystone markers, they're tangible reminders of their heritage, and they really matter. I mean, thinking about the next generation, we've got right. two generations on your screen right now, and we just want to continue this legacy and teach about our history. It also, for us, gives us a sense of place. Um, and I, I'm a, um, I'm interested in how people make connections, geographically speaking, and like right. to the land, and how, how they live off the land, and their interaction, how it changes over time. Um, so, like, for example, I mean, the air in Airville. Like, right. if you live in Airville, did you know that that's what your town was named after? Or Cly or Newberry Town? Like, right. just understanding. And, and I mean, I grew up in Dallas Town and well, Yo. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I know Yo, but Dallas Town I didn't know until I was well into college. So, right. taking a little bit of pride in learning a little bit about your town, where it came from. Yeah, absolutely. So, these markers stand as this gateway from these markers, thinking about the concrete markers when you drive past them, they stand as this gateway from one community to the next. And people People are moving through these gateways at faster and faster speeds. Right. We're thinking about new technologies, not just the automobile, but planes and trains and our phones and our computers. Mm -hmm. And so we're losing like this, this, this cementation in place. So like no longer do you grow up in this accidental place that you were born. Right. Like I was born at York Hospital. Otto was born at York Hospital and I'm going to be staying in New York, but I'm not close to Yo. Like, right. like how many people actually live within 20 minutes of, of your hometown? Well, <laughs> I live in the same house. <laughs> I just moved to bedrooms. You moved down the hall, you said, yeah, right? My mom lives in the house she grew up in. Oh, that's cool. uh, my great grandpa's homestead is up the street. My aunt's so you're really property rooted. off of my great grandpa. You're like micro rooted. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> mom is in the back room celebrating, saying, "Please don't leave, <laughs> Otto. I, I hope he gets an education, but like, don't leave your county. Like, stay. No, stay we're gonna here. keep Otto local. He well, can't leave." It was funny when I was um, dating and I eventually found Luke. I was looking for someone who wasn't gonna move. Right. I, I appreciate um, people who have these careers. Like, for example, our brother-in-law lives in Manhattan because yep. he has a very specific job that he needs to have, and our other brother-in-law on Seattle but from the get-go I've always been like York County is where I'm staying I'll move to like Hanover you know like East Berlin <laughs> right but... central Pennsylvania local yeah my yeah. brother and sister-in-law live in Chicago she's from Philadelphia so mm, yeah yeah. So comment below if you live in York County and you're born and raised here, say why. And if you came to York County, like people don't know this, but the local historian Jim McClure was actually not from York County. I know. And he's Mr. York <laughs> County. He's a transplant. <laughs> well, his dark secret has been yeah. revealed. Breaking news on hometown history. So what is it about York County that attracted you to this place or that kept you here in the first place? Right. 
So now we're going to transition to a major road that sped up York County's connection to the outside world because, you know, there is a world outside of York County, <laughs> no. believe it or not. <laughs> uh, so today we know them as Route uh, 462 and Route 30, but the Lincoln Highway Association was formed in 1913 to build one of the first modern transcontinental roads. And it went straight through York as it crossed the length of our country. And this map features the Lincoln Highway and it shows the pride that we took in its system. It ran cross country from Times Square to the Golden Gate, New York City to San Francisco. And we celebrated Main Street across America with celebrations and parades. And it established York County and the region's status as being in the middle of a larger American story. So now here we are 30 years later and the PA Turnpike was considered the embodiment of the future of the modern travel. I, it's, it's not 30 years later. I spoke wrong. 1913 to now is not 30 years. So almost 30 years after, after the Lincoln Highway came the Pennsylvania Turnpike, and that was considered the embodiment of the future of modern travel. And that replaced the Lincoln Highway as the fastest route across mm. the country. And, you know, and that happens. Like we, we live um, off the Old Trail. And when you mm -hmm. think about, uh, I'll be going places that are in the York the Old Trail in Southern York County, but we'll hop on 83. Or, right. Or like Luke and I, for our first um, kind of adventure together, we wanted to go to Somerset, like Bedford mm -hmm. County. There was a really cool Airbnb that had a buffalo farm that I wanted to check out. And we actually decided to take Route 30 the whole right. way. And it was cool because it, it forced us, it reminded of like old Route 66, like cars, right. you know, yeah. the cars. I mean, I'm one of my only friends that doesn't have a turnpike easy pass. Mm. But a lot of my friends, it's just easier to hop right on the turnpike. And when they hear that I'm like a backroads person, yeah. they're like, doesn't that take forever? And I'm like, yeah, sometimes, yeah. I like it that yeah. way. You know, sometimes. I, I never thought about that. Like this symbolism of an easy pass because I have one. Yeah. Ah, very interesting. So fun fact, talking about turnpikes, um, the nation, the very first one in the nation went from Philadelphia to Lancaster, and this was in 1793. This proved the financial advantages of a well-maintained highway. And then this led to the first federally funded interstate highway called the National Road. This is Route 40. This is in 1811. And this put Pennsylvania on the map, moving faster. Right. So before interstates and sprawling highways, people traveled for the experience of the trip. They weren't just trying to get to the next place as mm -hmm. fast as they could. So they admired the natural scenery and appreciated the adventure of the unexpected. So they were thinking about, you know, where am I going to stop for dinner? What motel am I going to stay That at? would give me a heart attack. Like, <laughs> I like to know exactly where right. I'm staying. You're not just going to leisurely travel the countryside looking for the next place to stay. Travel? Can you imagine Jamie and Dami travel the country with no cell phones? No. No. <laughs> we I, wouldn't we make, both. I have a terrible sense of direction. We wouldn't make it. <laughs> but the Lincoln Highway, that's the experience that it gave yeah. people. So mm -hmm. Tom Davidson, another Another friend of ours launched a $40,000 campaign for signs on the Lincoln Highway. And you can check out his digital map that includes a listing of past and current landmarks and businesses along the Lincoln Highway. So I feel like if we did do a road trip, it would have to be like a central Pennsylvania Lincoln Highway yeah, trip. Yeah, have to be. Have to be. <laughs> With Tom in the backseat making sure we don't get lost. Uh, Tom was also instrumental in the Haines Shoe House. So here is a picture. If you've never been there, go and check it out. It's one of those like, you know, you're from York County if. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know of the the house made out of a shoe um so they are releasing so this is a different type of historical marker program in addition to the keystone markers which went at cities we also have these pa historical markers mm -hmm. um and they show more of that like history of the place they're a little bit longer but they're still that iconic blue and gold this brand new pennsylvania historical marker is going up at the shoe house so here's what it's going to read the shoe house was built in 1948 along the iconic Lincoln Highway, the nation's first improved roads for automobiles from New York City to San Francisco. The building is an exceptional example of programmatic architecture and was designed by York ar architect Frederick Remp. The shoe house the shoe-shaped structure was built by self-made millionaire Malin M. Hines and the shoe wizard, as was his kind of his nickname, to advertise his shoe, shoe business in New York County. Did you know that that's an Airbnb? I did find out that's an Airbnb. Yeah. I'm kind of sad that the ice cream shop and museum is gone, but I yeah. mean, I'm happy that they've kept the house. It's yeah. still a shoe house. It's still iconic and it's being used for something. So I can't be mad. Yeah, exactly. Business, bringing more people to York, tourism, right. tourism dollars are important. Absolutely. Um, once the Pennsylvania Museum Historical Commission approves the text of these signs, it's not easy right. to write these signs. It, it kind of takes uh, a fine-tuned idea of what you want to say. Right. Then they are cast in aluminum, which I thought was really cool. We want to show you a picture of what this looks like. Oh, wow. 
So they actually use um, a sand mold. So a craftsperson sets each individual character first into a metal plate. Think like original like printing press, right? right. Metal plate with letters. It's double checked for spelling and for spacing. And then the plate is used to make this sand mold. The foundry pours liquid hot aluminum into the sand. Once the plate cools, then they can just remove the sand. I think it's so interesting. It's like we're in this modern age, but we still cast using sand. I know. Sometimes the old way is the right way. Right, yeah. Yep. And then they will paint it the classic blue and gold. I like it. So the Haines Shoe House is one of over 2,500 PA historical markers, and 68 of those are in York County. There's one on Camp Security, the Susquehanna Canal, and famous people like Bob Hoffman, the founder of York Barbell, and James Smith, the singer of the DO, the signer Finer. of the DOI. Declaration of Can you imagine singing? We can sing the Declaration of <laughs> I mean, I probably have in school. You never know. I like to sing sometimes. Uh, these signs teach us about history and they're guideposts for travelers, and they attract tourists, which is nice. You can see people stop along the way and they're reading the signs, and they're a source of pride for Pennsylvania. And you can look at how many cool things happened yeah, in the county. I mean, really cool things. 68 of them in York County. I feel like that's a lot. That's pretty good. Yeah. Good. And today the nomination process can be done by anyone or any group and it's public driven, which means we have a say in what histories we remember. Mm -hmm. That means if you're watching this, you, you could put forth yes. to put a sign. It, that's not super easy, but it is public driven. I have some ideas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> this is where Dami was born. I can see it now. <laughs> Dami Schmiller, birthplace of. <laughs> first president of the United States. <laughs> first woman. Not pre <laughs> yeah, well, you got what I mean. First woman president. President of Newbury Town. <laughs> yeah. um, so when these Pennsylvania markers were first installed, the speed limit was 25 miles per hour. That made it very easy for motorists to read them as they went by or maybe safer their passengers to read them right. or to swing by. It was convenient. Um, but today, as we've already pointed out, we're moving faster and faster, mm -hmm. thinking about the Turnpike replacing the Lincoln Highway and Route 83 replacing the Old Trail, which is another Hometown History episode, by right. the way. Yeah, check, check it out. out. Yep. Um, so we're kind of in this like hurry. We're historians, and right. I, I can't say I always stop and read every sign. Like, I can't say that I always notice every sign. Right. 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 So, so it, question for you is that sometimes we have these very historical important places and we put the sign at the exact location for accuracy. Right. But sometimes it means it's off the beaten track and people can't stop or it's right. inconvenient. So do we put these signs at a major road that's maybe a quarter mile away that then facilitates more people actually seeing it? Otto doesn't Otto like that idea. No. <laughs> no. Or, or so what's more important, the historical accuracy of the exact location that maybe right. only a couple people see or a main location that more people see that then that's not exactly it. Right. It's hard. We should do a poll. We should do a poll. So um, if you're watching, let us know what you think in the comments. That would be interesting. Yeah. I'm curious to know what York County has to say about that. Now, there's one community that has been very successful mm -hmm. at getting people to stop and read the signs. Yeah, and that's Hanover. So they have a bunch of wayside markers that have been recently installed. And these outdoor storyboards cover little things like the Battle of Gettysburg to women journalists running miles to document President Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. And they're called the Heart of Hanover Trail Markers. And you can read more about them on witnessingyork.com, which is run by Jamie and Jim. Or you can drive down to Hanover yourself and you can read them for yourself right there. And it's like a free museum. You don't have to pay. You can walk right up to them. You can take your whole family. And uh, you can support Hanover while you're there. You can go into the shops and get something to eat, eat walk around. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Hanover is a really wonderful place. So it really is. It and it's a part of York County, it is. regardless of what they say. You are a part of York County. <laughs> Whether they want to be or not. <laughs> So despite all these efforts to conserve history, some signs are fading. So we are nearing the end of our program here, and we wanted to talk about ghost signs. So ghost signs are these old symbols uh, that were used as a form of advertising, but right. if they outlive the business that they were sponsoring or if they were neglected, they begin to fade. So we've got a couple examples here. Let me see. One... This shows you old Coca-Cola signs mm -hmm. uh, from the 1950s. So, I mean, we're talking 80, uh, you know, 75 right. years old. So eventually if people don't start replacing these, they're going to just keep on fading. Here's another one of Schmidt and Alt Paper Company. Mm -hmm. This was on Cadoris near South Penn Street Bridge. Um, and you can see it's fading on the brick facade. And some of these facades straight up come down if they're wrecked. 
Another one, though, that has been preserved is Sigmund and Whirlies. This is down in Glenrock. If you go on the North Central Ra Railway excursion, this ride goes right past it. So you can see as a kudos for Glenrock, they also have a thriving historical community where they took the time to preserve this, which we think is pretty cool. We also think that the name Ghost really fits in with these old signs because they provide an air of the past in a way that is a bit mysterious. Yeah, it sounds cool when you say, do you, do you know about the, the ghost, ghost signs? signs. <laughs> More people are like, are thinking of Gettysburg. Like, right. You know, it's like, yeah. oh no, the old signs that are fading. Duh. I always think of like the mail pouch tobacco advertisements on the side of barns. Oh yeah. Yeah. A barn. lot of them are faded. Yep. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Um, so if you've seen one of these ghost signs around York County, feel free to add it down below in some of the comments. Yeah. So some signs are fading and others are rising into view. So not all signs point to the past. Preservationist groups erect them as billboards to call attention to landmarks that might come down. Think about um, what's happening in Spring Grove right now. Yes. Okay. So we got a picture of it. There you go. At, or they're advertising green space that might be built over and protesters wave these signs and they stake them into the ground and they do whatever it takes to tell their stories. And these signs are temporary. Or are they? If a field is saved from the bulldozer or a building remains standing, those are the signs that the community values its quality of life. Sadly, the opposite is true as well. Yep. Sorry guys, Otto is getting a little cranky. The signs, he, he did not like them, but, but Otto <laughs> for his God. Now, so This Hoke House we think is really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, same with, there's another group of uh, individuals down in York who are showing um, the Pennsylvania Avenue in Manchester Township. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll go back up and talk a little bit more about the Hoke House first. So this is a 1950s era house that's in Spring Grove and it's under threat. So Rudders owns the property now, uh, but they were granted a demolition permit back in February. Mm -hmm. Now the public has been outraged. You can see here in this picture the protest signs trying to save it. And I will give Rudders a pat on the back. They gave the group over eight years to try to raise the money to put someone in there to make mm -hmm. it like an active use building. But it's to the point where they're like, well, what are we supposed to do? Um, but the locals are using signs as a form of protest um, so people know that it's important and they wanted to stay. Right. And I do think as a side note that this is a perfect example of they were given eight years, but it seems like until the last second, people don't really show how yeah. much they care. So, so you know, when you're thinking about things that are important to you in the county, you know, you have to take a stance early on. You can't just wait until D-Day yeah. and say, yeah. you know, I'm going to chain myself to the building before you bulldoze it over. <laughs> like You didn't care the past 10 years. Yeah. Now. You know, yep. you've got to take the initiative. So here's a little bit more about the Pennsylvania Avenue signs. Right. So along Pennsylvania Avenue in Manchester Township, the zoning board has approved a new industrial warehouse next to the Prospect Hill Cemetery, which is also another episode that we've mm -hmm. done. Yeah. Um, so go check that out on YouTube. And Inch and Co. purchased the 50 plus acre property back in 2021. Like the Hoke House, protests, uh, protesters want to stop the development. These controversies bring the roads and the signs together That's into one, one movement. movement. So, I mean, literally, they're standing on the road saying, we don't want the warehouse uh -huh. here. And there's signs back there that say, Stop. So I took this from a Facebook group, Residents Against Warehouse on PA Avenue. Facebook yeah, group. yeah, I've seen that. They're really mobilizing, which they is are. interesting because they're taking the signs from the street and they're taking pictures and putting it on Facebook. online. Yeah. Power of online. I mean, that's why we're here right now. Absolutely. So now that we are at the end of our program, we want to revisit these takeaways. So you leave here being a little bit more smarter and more educated in yes. your county. One is that these signs are efficient ways to catch a glimpse into our past. They establish your county and the region's role in the larger American story and how we all connect. They are versatile. They translate well online for students and researchers, and they force us to slow down and read the signs. Right. So you know that we are back now and we're going to do content every month, hopefully. Uh, if auto allows us yeah. to. So we're on auto schedule now, <laughs> uh, but hopefully we will be back on June 28th at 7 p.m. We're trying to be Montana in... Yes. Oh. oh, okay. We just found out from our silent partner, Jim McClure, <laughs> that we're going to be at Penn Market for our next episode. So 
uh, tune in on June 28th. Yeah, put it in your calendar. Yes. We are leaning towards in person. Mm -hmm. So we will, we, we do this free of charge. We will not be like selling tickets. We might have you sign up so we can get a total for the number of seats. It's nice but... to have a head count, but yeah, it's totally free to come. And you know, if you are SVP and you can't make it, you can still watch us on Facebook Live. Yeah. June 28th, 7 yes. p.m. Penn Market. Thanks guys. See ya.